Just like the story we read last week, Jesus leaves this parable open-ended. What will that elder son do? What do you think he should do? Should he stand firm and demand some recompense from his brother? Or should, let, or should he let go of his anger and join the party? As I read this story, it occurs to me that while the elder son is expressing anger toward his father, the one he's really angry at is his brother, right? The younger son, by demanding his inheritance early, dishonored and insulted his father. He basically said, I wish you were dead. Just give me my inheritance now so I can leave this place and be gone forever. And then he got as far away as he could. He abandoned all of his obligations to his family, including his obligation to care for his father in his old age. And he left his older brother holding the bag. In his anger, the elder assumes or imagines the worst about this younger sibling and is unwilling even to acknowledge him as family, which is fitting because that's what the younger son did, was cut all those family ties. But this all makes me pay attention to the context in which Jesus is telling this parable, right? He's speaking to scribes and Pharisees who are grumbling about the kind of people that, with whom Jesus spends time. His story is aimed at them, and it seems to ask whether they will let their beliefs about morality and holiness and purity keep them from enjoying God's party. It reminds me that Paul, too, is writing in the context of conflict. When he writes this letter to the Corinthians, uh, it's in the middle of some sort of disagreement that he's had with them, and it's left some of them upset with him. So as he's writing about reconciliation, he's not only encouraging them to be reconciled to God, but also to himself. Reconciliation is different than forgiveness. It recognizes that our actions have consequences. And sometimes those consequences damage relationships. They can't simply be forgotten. But just as some actions damage relationships, others can have the power to heal them. Reconciliation, then, is the hard work of acting to heal broken relationships, to make amends. In the text study this week, we talked at length about what it means to be reconciled to God. How do we do that? What are we responsible for? God takes the first step, but what is left to us in that process? How might we, how can we heal our relationship with God? As I read these stories, I'm left wondering if being reconciled to God is as much about being reconciled with one another, that maybe those two things aren't separate. One of the major themes of our Lenten reflection each year is repentance from sin. In Hebrew, the word for sin means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. It means to fall short. Sin is not about morality. It's about failing to live in the way that God created us to live. Most often, we see that in the ways that we harm one another. But what we sometimes overlook is that the sins that seem to be purely against God, like idolatry, for example, even those sins have implications for how we treat one another. Who and how we worship those guiding principles in our lives, those necessarily inform and shape our relationships with one another, don't they? Whether we act with justice or value fairness, the value that we give to other people, especially those not in our in-group, the standards by which we judge our neighbors, all of these are affected by our worship. I think today about those things that are killing us. Things like war, poverty, oppression, climate change, racism, xenophobia, crime. And I notice that all these are the results of our disunity with one another and with creation. Reading these kind of stories, I so often hear from people a veiled fear of God's punishment 
for failing to live up to the standards that they set. But here I am today wondering if our biggest problem isn't God's wrath, but rather the natural consequences of our own sin. I hear God inviting us in these stories into a better way of being in the world, one that's balanced and healthy based on love rather than greed or fear or hatred. And yet, at the same time, as I consider these sins, I can't help but notice that at their core, very often, is a kind of imperfect love, right? We go to war, for example, to protect the people in the places we care about. We just sort of stop caring when it comes to the border. Poverty and racism and oppression are all the consequences of us hoarding resources or privilege for ourselves, afraid that if we share, we won't have enough to go around. And so we have to draw a line where we stop caring. Pollution and destruction of the earth comes from carelessness, from placing our needs above the needs of our ecosystems. Love may be at the root of all these things, but it is a love that has fallen short of what God intends it to be. That's sin. We love, but our love is finite. It's limited. God's love, on the other hand, is infinite. The father in Jesus' parable seems to value his younger son more than he does his property or uh, his uh, reputation. He values his elder son more than the party he's hosting or the child that he's celebrating as returned from the dead. That kind of love is what we aim for, but we fall short. We end up shooting ourselves in the foot, wounded by our own sin. Earlier in his letter, Paul writes about the heavenly home which God has waiting for us. And he says that the guarantee of this promise is the Holy Spirit which God has given us. I notice, as he says that, that the Spirit is the one who draws us together, who gathers and strengthens us as community. She is the one, Paul writes elsewhere, who gives individuals gifts like preaching or prophecy, but gives those gifts, right, for the building up of community. She is also the one that we recognize hovering over the waters at creation as God speaks everything into being. Paul believes that we are created to be in community with one another and with the whole creation and with God. That's the goal that we're aiming for. And that's the promise that the Spirit's presence guarantees. But, of course, community has its challenges, doesn't it? Wherever two or three are gathered, Jesus may be present, but so is conflict. Community is hard. It's so easily broken. We so easily turn away from one another. We cast blame and we exclude each other because our love simply isn't big enough. We see it in churches all the time. We've seen it in this one, but we also see it in politics, in schools, and anywhere else people come together. Love at times may feel like some trick that we simply just can't master, or a skill for which we just may not have the aptitude, right? Our inability to love perfectly keeps us, keeps condemning us to the same old cycle of distrust and fear and violence. And yet, God's promise is that community is our destiny. Not the tiny communities we have now, cliques and groups and societies based on ethnicity or social class or nationality, but community with a capital C. The community of God, held together by the Holy Spirit. Her presence among us now is the guarantee that this is not what may be if we work hard enough, but what will be, regardless. We see glimpses of that community at times when we're lucky in this one and in others. 
In the beginning, we recall, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God brooded over the face of the deep, God spoke light and creation into being. With a word, God created humankind in God's own image, male and female. God did this in love. God did this by means of love. God did this so that we might join together in that love. We are created in love, by love, and for love. That love is at our core. It is the image in which we are created and which we still bear. It is the imago dei, the image of God. Our human nature, what Paul sometimes refers to as the flesh, it distorts and it hides that image, but that image is still there, still inside of us, God alive in us, deep at our core. The Spirit testifies to this presence of God within us. She says that love is not some skill we'll never master. It is, in fact, our source and therefore also our destiny. I was thinking this week, and as I think about this imperfect, falling short kind of love that marks our existence now, I begin to see not only the ways that it misses the mark, but also what it's aiming at, what it's trying so hard to imitate. And it makes me think of a child learning by example. Little kids learn by imitating their parents and the adults around them they respect, right? And at first their imitations are poor, and clumsy. We call them cute. But over time and with practice, they get more and more refined until in adulthood, they finally come, we finally become proficient at the things that we've been watching others do and practicing our whole lives. And I wonder if the same isn't true of love. I think this might be what Paul is referring to when he talks about the new creation in Christ. I think he means that the old human way of thinking and being, the, and the phrase that he uses here in Greek is according to the flesh, that when that old human way of thinking dies with Christ, it passes away, like childhood does. He sees the adult creation emerging from what dies and is left behind, the new creation. This is the message he says, that God has given him to share. And I find it interesting that the NRSV chooses to translate that word as message. Because in Greek, it's word. It's logos. The word of reconciliation. Just like the word that God spoke into the formless void at creation, and just like the living word that became incarnate in Palestine. Reconciliation. Healing into community is the word that God speaks to create us and everything anew. And so I hear Paul today inviting us to see this vision with him. Begging us to look inside ourselves, past the fear and the anger, past the hurt that's been done, past the flesh. And to see buried deep within ourselves that love that has always been there from the very beginning. To know that this love is our source and our goal. It is our destiny. It's what we are still being created to be. When Christ died, he died for all, Paul reminds us, and therefore we have all died. What remains is a new creation. There's no longer any need to hang on to old fears, old prejudices, old human points of view. When our bodies eventually die and our flesh passes away, we will finally be gathered into that community of God in fullness. But that doesn't mean we have to wait for that death. Because the Spirit is upon us now, living within and among us, inviting us to experience that community here and now, to begin that work of reconciliation. What's left to us is to figure out what that reconciliation looks like. 
For those among us with privilege and power, like the scribes and Pharisees, maybe it looks like putting aside our fears and our prejudices and going in to join the party. But what about those who are vulnerable? What does it look like for them? When is it appropriate for us to forgive sins? And when is it necessary for us to heal them, to atone for them? Where and how do you see God calling us to heal or to be healed so that we can come in and join the party?